afternoon, and welcome to Straight Talking with Kelly. This is where you will meet the most talented, intelligent, and creative people who come to share tips, resources, and knowledge on various topics. The guests come from many industries that include education, music, television, theater, culinary arts, hospitality, health and wellness, and so much more. Join me and my guest today, Elijah Baker. He's the co-founder and CEO of Ambitious Records and also a founding member of the R&B group, Tony, Tony, Tony. Welcome, Mr. Baker. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Oh, this is going to be fun. I'm so excited about having you. So before we get started, we're going to talk about his record label, Ambitious Records, and the state of the music industry. Let me read a little bit about his background. Elijah Baker is a co-founder and CEO of Ambition Records. He got his start by playing an essential role as a founding member of the multi-platinum R&B group, Tony, Tony, Tony. He choreographed all of the group's hypnotic moves and dance steps and is known for their show-stopping stage performances. His bass playing, dancing, and singing are reminiscent of musical greats like Bootsy Collins, James Brown, and Marvin Gaye, respectfully. He has made his mark as a renowned producer, pushing soul music to new heights. There is so much more to him than this, so stay with me as we get deeper into the interview. So, Elijah, before yes. we talk about your time as a founding member of Tony, 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 and your label, Let's walk down memory lane. I'll never forget the day that Mr. Carlos Stanfield called me and says, hey, I want you to come and meet the boys. That's what he would call you guys, the boys. That's and, what we uh, were. <laughs> yeah, you guys were pretty young then too, for sure. And, you know, it was a really good time. He was managing you guys at the time. And so after I met you guys, I was like, oh my God, they're so young. They got so much talent and energy and life ahead of them. And then fast forward, here we are. So what do you remember about those days? Um, hard work, lots of rehearsals, and all common goals to be successful in, yes. in our work in the music industry, which we did. Yeah, yeah, you did. So now let's talk about where you were born and raised and what schools did you attend? I was born in Monroe, Louisiana, but I was brought to Oakland in a station wagon before I was one years of age. So I was, I was, uh, I was born in 1968. I was in Oakland, California in 1968. So, um, I went to a lot of schools. I went to, uh, Lafayette, Durant, and West Oakland. Then I merged over to Hawthorne and off of Fruitvale. Then I went to Hamilton to turn to Calvin Simmons off 35th Ave. And then I ended up at Castlemont High School and graduated there. Okay. And that's, that is such a famous high school, isn't it? Because of all the musical talent that has come out of there. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. All, all six members. Um, with Castlebot. Is that right? Yes. All at the same time or at different times? No, uh, uh, Dwayne, he's the oldest. He went there with Jesus Christ. And the rest of us was in Raphael, Carl, and Dwayne. I mean, Raphael, Carl, and Tim graduated 84. I graduated 86. And Antron came out in like 88. Oh, but all of you guys went to that school. That is amazing. So now you come from a musical family. Talk about that, because your dad played music. Is that correct? Yes, my dad is a gospel quartet singer in legendary right of Bay. Um, and we just musically inclined. We saw him play, his friends come over, playing in the living room, and we go to church every Sunday. And it was just intriguing to us, and it was in our blood. And my brother, Eric, picked it up seriously. He's like three years older than me. I picked it up, but my oldest brother, Greg, he know how to play the bass. And my father made sure my sisters know at least how to play one song on a, on, a, on a guitar. Okay, nice. Wow. Wow. 
So now, how did you become a member of the Tonys? How did that come about? Well, Tony, Tony, Tony started, I would probably say like 87, um, because Raphael, Tim, and Carl went on the road with Sheila E. And when they came off tour, which is either 86 or 87, they formed Tony, 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 along with Carl Wheeler. They just went in there and do a recording called One Night Stand, and they did one wedding reception as the three. And after that, Raphael called in me and Antron, and Antron is Timothy Riley's uh, first cousin, and Raphael Sadiq is my first cousin. Okay. So Raphael's mom and dad are sisters? Your mom and their, his mom Raphael, and your dad? Uh, brothers and sisters, yeah, they're siblings. And Tim... And Atron, Tim's mother and Atron dad are brothers and sisters, just to say. That is amazing. That is so amazing. And then Ralph Fiel is also brothers with Half Wayne. brother with Wayne, same father. <laughs> so this whole group was all family, basically. And Carl Wheeler, we knew him since five years old. He, she stayed right around the corner for Raphael. So, so that's that's, he grew up with you guys. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Now, you know what? But that's interesting that all of that beauty and all of the family love turned out to be not so beautiful based on that YouTube video that you did um, that's called Loyalty No Royalty, the breakup of Tony, Tony, Tony. One of the things that I noticed about that, you got over 1.3 million views on that. It was a heart-wrenching experience for you regarding how it all played out. And I gathered from watching it that um, several of the band's members, all it seemed like all you guys wanted was an apology. Yeah, pretty much. Um, for the last, I will say, since 2012, I've been trying to put the band back together. And, you know, there's days that Raphael was with it, and he was all the way with it, which he was one of the hardest ones to actually want to do it at first. Then when he wanted to do it, Dwayne didn't want to do it. So this kept going back and forth to like 2018. And by that time, I'm like fed up. I don't even want to do it no more. Like, so I'm like, oh, we, we, we are getting old. Like, y'all let yeah. a lot of money pass through our hands. We got kids in college. And, and it's no simpler way to make a lot of money than what we established. And yeah. so I was just not understanding the logic why they wouldn't see that through. Like Dwayne still tour, but they don't make the amount of money the originals could make together. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, because so, people would love seeing you guys reunite. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't think Dwayne's position is about money. It's about the power in the position he's in as controlling and treating Tony, Tony, Tony as if it's, it's his own. And he knows yeah. collectively if all the originals came back, that would be the position. Yeah. Well, you know what, to my listening audience, if you wanna hear this interview in full detail, I highly recommend that you go to Ambitious Records on YouTube. Is that correct? Is that where they would go to hear? Yeah, Ambitious Records Incorporated on, on YouTube. Loyalty, no royalty. The break yeah, the and that, yeah, and then that way they can hear the whole tape because I don't want to go over the whole thing because it's really intense, really. And, you know, I, I I felt your passion in it and I felt like not just you, but even some of the other band members, just a sincere apology would have been a way to erase all the pain. Yeah, you know, ironically, that was definitely our angle to explain to them how we felt. You know, we we talk about it, but for some reason, we could all never just sit in the room and sit as men and discuss it because everybody too afraid of the confrontation because it's going to be confrontation. Absolutely. And, um, but I sent the documentary to Raphael, Tim, and Dwayne before I even put it out. Oh. Just to see the response they would give me. And they didn't say nothing. They didn't say nothing back. They just got mad, and they <laughs> they became bonded because Raphael and Dwayne didn't have no relationship um, during 
several years prior to the documentary. They were still brothers and loved each other, but they wouldn't you know, spend no time or communicating uh, on a regular basis. Okay, okay. But that documentary brought them three together against us four, us five. <laughs> Oh, it's craziness and all of you guys are family so I just pray that one day it works itself out but like you said you guys are getting older and pretty soon the time will elapse and then there's no sense of even trying to do it exactly and that's pretty yeah. much what we're today but this link ways uh, segues me into your ambitious record and it's a partnership with what's Tony Draper of Suave House Music how did you guys be begin your collaboration and tell me about ambitious records came up with Ambitious Records in 2012, and Tony Dripper is like a brother of mine. I used to produce his artist back in the late 90s. I used to go to Houston, Texas, Jubal and myself, and my brother Kenya used to work with him before me, and we just bonded this relationship that turned the brotherhood, and you know, from his expertise and experience, I um, hooked up with him on my first album, The Soul Collation, and you know, he took care things that he could, but the music business changed so drastically that we had to shift it into a different direction, which is kind of actually hard for the older generation. Oh, T tell me how, like how? Well, if you notice, there is no live musicians, R&B musicians um, on anywhere in the public's eye. Like you see all the country bands and Western bands, they still got a country music awards and they still play their instruments. Uh, uh -huh. Hip hop then just took over everything. Yeah. And, <laughs> and anything, they don't play, they don't play instruments in hip hop, right? Right. And any R and B sound like hip hop. So, but Bruno Mars is the only closest yes. thing we have, but he's not a black man. But isn't his father black? He's not a black man. They from the islands. They got some. They got some soul. Uh, they, they. I think they um, Hawaiian. I don't know the proper uh, race, but I do know that they're not African American or African descent. Now, so but the gentleman that plays with him. Um, you talking about Anderson Pack? Yes. That's Silk Sonic, but Bruno Mars has been doing that before they collab and did their thing. Okay, okay, because they're really talented. I love their music, actually. Oh, they also. Awesome. Yeah. Now, isn't um, Frankie Beverly still plays his music band, doesn't he? Yeah, but he hasn't recorded it since 1987. Like, he have not put oh. a record out since 1987. Tony, 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 Wow, that's really scary. I know Prince would have a fit because he definitely wanted people to play instruments. He just couldn't understand why people didn't. Well, you know, I'm, I have some of the pipelines where I'm going around nationwide discovering new independent R&B black bands. I take a white boy as long as you sing R&B, but I want R&B bands. People play instruments. So yeah. I'm starting to campaign or even a reality show about finding the next R&B band. You know, that's funny because Arnie Frager, you remember Arnie from the plant recording studios. Yes. He and I talked about that. Carlos and I talked about it. Like, where is R&B music? We want it back. I want Tell it back. What? It's in all the nook and crannies of the South, the Midwest, the East Coast. And even open, it's just underground independently. The majors won't pick it up. They don't want nothing live. They don't want nothing positive on the radio. They just want program beats and trash lyrics. Yeah, yeah. Now, so tell me about your 3T uh, group. 3TOB. 3TOB. Yeah, 3T stands for Tony, Tony, Tony. The OB stands for the original band. So the fellas and I, since we couldn't... Wait, before you do that, tell me who the members are in that 3T original band. Carl Wheeler, Antron Hill, Jubal Smith, Amar Khalil, 
and myself, Elijah Baker. Okay, and all of you guys were Tony, Tony, Tony members. Yeah, affiliated. Me, Carl, and Antron was the only signed members. Okay, but, okay. Uh, Amar been in the group over 20 years consecutively, filled in for Raphael, so he's been in love with any one of us consecutively. And um, <laughs> Jubal is responsible for pretty much the entire third album with his influence on the guitar and here's what he brought in. So um, he, he, he recreated the Tony sound single-handedly. Oh, wow. Now, Carlos had sent me some of your music and I was floored. I was like, oh my God, this sounds so good. Trading Places was the jam. I was like, who is singing this? I had to call him. I'm like, okay, what's tell you got to talk to me about this. It was my favorite out of all of the other songs that you had sent. Whoever was singing it, I'm like, oh my God, they got a voice. The music, it has such an old school vibe. Uh, Never Gonna Give You Up reminded me of Jerry Butler. You know Jerry Butler, the Iceman yes. coming? His Never yes. Gonna Give You Up? That yeah. intro sounded just like, I was just like, I was into it. I was like, this is real music. I mean, it had me jazzed. Well, um, all of it came organically. Um, Trading Places, when I finished the documentary, I contacted the said, we need a, a song for the soundtrack of this documentary. I didn't even know where I was going to place. I just knew we needed a song. That was my way of trying to get them to do a song together. Okay. <laughs> and it worked. So okay. We to the studio. And we didn't have no direction, none whatsoever. Antron came up with the name Trading Places before we even made some music. He said, it'd be a good idea for the name of the song to be Trading Places. So we started there. So uh, we just got a studio, me, Carl, and Jubu, and trying. And, you know, just put some things together. And when we first started, truthfully, we was like, it's all right, you know. But then it started, <laughs> it started the music started gelling, then it, it started coming together even more. So so now we had to write the lyrics to it. So Amar and his cousin, um, can't think of his name right now, but it's, yeah, it's Justin. It's because of Justin Goss. They uh, started the writing in um, the first verse. Then I wrote the second verse. And... Um, then everybody just started diving in on the harmonies and ranging, and, and it just came up just like that. Who's singing it? Amar Khalil is the singer on that song. Well, you tell Amar, Amar, if you listening to me, keep up that voice. Your voice is the bomb. He was singing that song. Oh, well, yeah. And, and the ironic that he the one replaced Raphael, Sadiq, and Tony to the Tony. So he don't sound like Raphael on that song. No, not at all. Exactly. So it's time for him. That's why we're pushing him hard to this time for him to have his own identity. For the whole 20 years, he would introduce himself as A. Mark Khalil. But after the show, just when they said, Raphael, can we have your autograph? Oh, wow. Because they kind of still had this. They was best friends in childhood. All, okay. the, way to high, all the way to high school. And to they, they graduated together in high school. So they went to junior, they went to elementary, junior high, and high school together. Okay. So they was they had a family bond. They too. had a close. Okay. Now it's interesting because now I love Raphael's voice. I love you know uh, it feels good is my favorite song of the right. Tonys. But I listening to Trading Places, I never put the two together. And maybe because I didn't hear, I need to hear him sing other songs that maybe he'll sing no, like that's, Raphael. That, 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 that's beautiful. That, that's what we was looking for. That's what, that's the well, yeah, because he didn't sound anything like him to me at all. I didn't think so either, but when he had to sing Raphael songs, he had to sound like well, He Raphael. could sound like that. Yeah, he could sound like that. Well, good for him to be able to, to, to be able to do that. But yeah, so, so you guys got some good music coming out. So that's, one group that you're working with, are you working with any other thing? One of the things that I know about you when I did research on you, you have worked with some incredible artists over the years. Thank you. I mean, I was like, talk to me about that. Some of the people you produce, some of the people's albums you were on, let the audience know who you've worked with. Um, I'm a, I'm, I'm a knucklehead in the group, so I, I work with people like Too Short. E forty, you know, Daz, Dillinger, Dog Pound, um, uh, Sugar T. We did collect. Tony did some of Alicia Keys. I was a part of that. Um, 
DJ Quick. I have right. Let's get down. Um, and then you had like Snoop Dogg. Yeah, Snoop Dogg. That's on Snoop Dogg. And YT style. Um, this goes on. Yeah, I was like, okay, so you were, and you were, you are a music producer. So you, right. you did that. And you, do you still do that as well? Yes. Uh, you know, I have my own label, Ambitious Records, and I'm producer of it. Um, I got a project called Soul Palation. That's my project, but I collab with friends of mine, Mario Corbino, Silky, Dee Dee Simons, um, Jubal, um, Forgive me if I'm missing somebody. Monet, uh, Otis Cooper, even Raphael Sadiq collabed on that project. Um, who else? Intricate. Um, That's kind of cool when you can't remember all the people that you work yeah, with. <laughs> Billy Ray Kemp, um, Greg, Jarius, Mazza, he had write songs for um, uh, Silk Sonic. Um, okay. okay. Yeah, Bobby G. I have a lot of people. When I do a project, I just call everybody who I feel. Um, they're accused. Everybody who I feel that can do something that I came that I hear when I'm producing yeah. a song, the direction I need to go. I, I just contact that person who I feel gonna enhance that song the way I hear it. Okay. So now let's talk about. You feel like there is a lack of black positive music in the black community. So talk to me about when did the downfall happen? I, and you know, I don't want to blame everything on rap because there is some positive rap music. As a matter of fact, when rap first started, it was very positive. I don't I don't blame rap. I blame the executives at the record company. Ah, okay. Well first of all, this this where it, it went wrong yet. They start mocking anybody who was successful. Mm -hmm. They always wanted, if uh, uh, somebody comes successful, like when Hammer came out, they want the next Hammer, which they brought in Vanilla Ice. Ah, uh, okay. I mean, immediately, you saw that, right? Yeah. Yeah, even, but a white boy this time. Yep. But you know, they've been doing that for years. I don't know if you've seen the new Elvis Presley movie. I heard about, about the Colonel. Now, so, and I have read the book about the Colonel, but the Colonel was a piece of work. But this movie actually for once showed that Elvis Presley got all of his talent from black folks. He stole right. it all and that's what they promoted. So when he did it, it was okay. Exactly. But when we do it, it's a whole different ball game. Remember Motown Records, they had to put white faces on their album covers. So, so the record industry has been like that for a long time. One thing that I like about rap is that these rap artists, Jay-Z and the rest of them, they took control of their industry. So they were able to, they learned the business and they were able to challenge these people one-on-one. -on -one. Well, And they've done a good job at it, I think. They, they did in, a, in, a, in the nineties, they did when it was when they was involved in making their own music. But as ex executive, they all doing a poor job because Jay-Z was running Def Jam. He ain't bring out no more Jay-Z's. Um, he didn't bring out nobody who even a caliber that's good. Kanye West came up under Dame Dash. Jay Z didn't believe in Kanye West, and Kanye West, you see how he turned out, another billionaire. Yeah. My yeah. thing is right now, I, I do my homework. I, I just put on Apple Music and let the current rap music play. Uh huh. First of all, I probably knew about three of them, three of them artists. Second of all, second of all. They all was talking about killing. Huh. I mean, every song was wow. talking about killing us. And I'm like, and it, it was all very successful. And I'm like, that's what the industry doing. They yep. promote all the poison. Yep. For our young generation. Yep. To send all to jail. But that keeps us down. So they know what they're doing. It's, it's by design. Exactly. So that's the problem. It ain't hip hop. It's the executives in charge. And that's the only thing they promote is the trash. Yeah. So it's up yeah. to us. That's what I'm yes. trying to form. That's exactly what I'm trying to form now. I call I'm going, I'm, in, I'm in Cleveland, Ohio right now. I'm going somewhere to hear a band tonight and go talk to them, go film them on my channel 
and say, I want y'all to compete in this battle the bands I'm doing. But when I pick a band, it's not to win or lose. It's for us to join forces to become another band in the public's eye. When okay. I get them, I want all of them to still be a part of my brand. And okay. we build okay. together and we can set certain groups together on this tour, certain groups together, which one match the best. And okay, little Barry Gordy, there you that's go. That's right, that's right. I, I, <laughs> little Barry I'm not, Gordy. I'm not trying to be the best bass player, I'm trying to be the best Barry Gordy I can be. Yes, absolutely. And that was, do you know what? Now that has been my idol. Uh, even though Prince and Michael Jackson are my favorite artists, but Barry Gordy has been my musical idol for forever because that man was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I have two of the best compliments people gave me. One guy said, I got the personality of Muhammad Ali. Shoot. I was like, yeah. and, and another guy named Ricardo Love, he's a musician in the Bay Area. He called me Barry Gordy the other day. So he said, Nice. God put, so I want to live up to that. You know? Nice. Well, you know what? Carlos used to call me Suzanne Dupas. <laughs> because of the artist development that I did. And I was like, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll be her, okay? Yeah. yeah, so that's pretty cool. So yeah, I, I want to single-handedly bring R&B bands back. I don't, I don't care what it is. I just want to see the youngsters excited about playing instruments again. You know where you find them all at? In church. That's where they all at. Oh yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so, but you know what? That's where you find most good stuff. <laughs> Yeah, and they all in church, and they all in nightclubs. The local Duke join at nighttime, so I go yeah. one at all of them. I go to South Carolina, I go to North Carolina, I go to Mississippi, I go to Louisiana, I go to Texas, I go to Arkansas. So I you're actually Florida. traveling around to meet with these artists. Yes. Wow. I wow. have on Facebook, I have on Facebook. So what I do is I go to their page. And I like them. I say, man, send me a five minute video and I'll put you against another band I like. And I'm like, the people vote, but y'all already in because I like both of y'all anyway. We're just going to battle and just build this community and at the same time promote your music. So, yeah, that's beautiful. I just, don't, I just started this weekend. It's, it's, it's going off well. You know, I'm, I'm wow. kind of down king in it. I'm promoting it. I'm going to be a messy. You know what I'm saying? I'm just. So what you like, say? You gonna be the Don King of the music industry? Yeah, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm a promoter like that. You know, like a real WWE yeah. Vince yeah. McMahon. That pisses all people who understand. They want they want a little drama. They want some excitement. So yeah. we're gonna get into it. It's kind of like the verses, how they have the popular artists competing against each other. Right. Yeah. 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 So I think that's pretty clever. Pretty clever. Yeah, I want to I, I, I make the unpopular pop. Now, so, and see, that's what I do. That's what I love about this podcast, where I'm able to promote people like you. I want people to hear and see all of the talent that we have here in the Bay Area. And that's why I love what I do with this podcast. Now, one of the things I want to know is that if people want to be a part of your, your, your musical journey, before we end, I want to make sure that you tell them how they can reach you. Okay. Okay, because I think it's really important because you've just shared a lot of pearls of wisdom and I'm sure there's other people out there that would want to collaborate with you and to help get this R&B thing back on the scene. I would love to have that back. Uh, and then I wish we could have been able to play a little bit of the Trading Places because I love that song so much. And I'm sure yeah. you don't have it with you. I have it with me. I do have it with me. Let me see. Well, let's my, play it. This is my speaker charge. Hold on. What's that? Okay, let, let's play. <laughs> yeah, I would love to hear some of that because I absolutely love that song. Make sure that I got any juice here. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. That's a cute. I found one here, one. Hold on. I got a charge. Hold on. Okay. So we're taking a commercial break while Elijah is actually charging his machine so we can listen to one of his songs, Trading Places. Now, so tell me, what's your relationship with Mr. Carlos Stanfield right now? Carlos has always been a good friend of the entire band. Me and him just took on a special bond because when he left the group, 
I stayed in contact with him. And we just, everybody did, but I, I stayed mostly in contact with him. And um, we just maintained a solid friendship. So I also consider him as family as well. So, you know, it's just that um, he's, a, he's a good person. He, he meant well. And Sit back a little bit so I can see you. You're okay. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, he's a good person. He meant well. And he tried to do the right thing. And, you know, everybody makes some mistakes. And I don't hold that against him. Well, he was young and he was learning and he did the exactly. best that he could. He 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 got him to the show. He did that. He did what he's he did what he came out to do. He got us yep. out there and yep. we we was there. And can't nobody say we wasn't because we was there. Yep. No, he did his role. He definitely did that. And also I got two solo records out. I have Street Savior I did back in the 90s. And then I have um a real mother bonker. It's okay. an all it's an all funk record. Um, I have a loyalty no royalty soundtrack. I have a solo artist named Bergeretta for have a single out. I have uh, another artist I collaborate with CJ Hilton. We collaborate on a single that we have out. Okay. So we have some. Music what about any? Do you have any female vocalists or anything like that? We all featured on the Soul Palation album. Okay. Simon and and Silky and Miss Monet. They are okay. featured on that project, so you want to okay. hear them, that's where you go. Now, is there any places where people can show, where you can showcase your music these days? Because I know, you know, I don't know about the nightclub scene anymore. Where do people showcase talent? Um, They have venues, but for the most part, in Oakland, it's Yoshi's. That's the number one spot. Okay. I, okay. I, I did that twice, sold out twice. Juju did it. His group, Big Divine, they sold out. Amar did it, he sold out. Carl Wheeler did it, he sold out. So um, we had that venue, and we work on some others right now. We're going to do a 3 TOB release, and I'll let you know about that. And you okay. can see it. So we work okay. on that right now. Okay, okay. here he goes trading places. Let me see if the volume all right. <laughs> So that if they want to hear the rest of it, they got to go to your spot. Yeah. That was awesome. It's so R&B. I love it. It's so old school. It just, you know, it kind of re it's reminiscent of the, the red light parties back in the day. Right. Yeah, we just try to keep the tradition alive. Like, you know, we all contribute on that Tony sound. So um, we can't be hindered. We just got to go pretty much. Well, because you guys it. are excellent musicians, my God. You know, and the simple fact that you continue to go on and you have big dreams ahead of you, you know, yeah. there's no looking back. It's just moving forward. Yeah, we try, you know, just got to just do it, you know. Yeah, well, you guys are doing it. Now, I want to switch gears a little bit. I want you to now name three people that have inspired you. And it doesn't have to be musical. It could be just people in your life that have inspired you. 
<sighs> that's that's hard. That's like that's like too many people to name. Like I've been inspired by so many. So to, to narrow it down to three, that's kind of like disrespectful. But I will try. Um, of course, my father, Elijah Baker Sr., which he had a record out that I produced, me, Raphael, my brother Kenya, Jubu, Carl Wheeler, and Billy Ray um, Kemp. Um, that was it's called The Palm of My Hands. So my father, um, musically, Cameo had a big influence on me. I love Cameo. I also love Prince. I also love Boys. <laughs> I also love Bootsy. I also love Blowfly. I also love, uh, uh, you know, the the Bars family. It's it's just so many that I also love Babyface. I I also love Teddy Riley. You know, <laughs> Marvin Gaye. You know, the list goes on. Gladys Knight is my favorite female singer. So it doesn't have to be music. Now you didn't went through the whole musical catalog. Now who else? I, I really haven't, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just have so many daily influences. So, yeah. all right, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna stick with my dad for the most influence. So okay, everybody else, it, it's too many people to name, and I don't, okay. I don't want nobody out. Right, because you know, folks be like, "How come you didn't say me?" Huh? Yeah, so it's a lot of I'm talking about daily, you know. Males and females. So now tell me, what would the nine-year-old Elijah say to the grown man Elijah today? Nine-year-old Elijah? Or what would the grown man Elijah say to the nine-year-old Elijah? No. <laughs> what would the nine-year-old say to you now? The nine-year-old. What was your journey like? What did you do? What would he say to you? He would say, you did everything you said to his mom. That's what he was saying. Nice. Everything I, I claimed I was going to do or claim I wanted to buy, I did. Okay. I still okay. have I still have a few more goals to accomplish. And the next one is to be Barry Gordy. The, uh, the other one is to be Jay-Z, P. Diddy, Elijah Baker, Kanye West, Dr. Dre. I want to be on that bracket. Yeah. Okay. All right. Join the You want to join the Billionaires Club? Yes. And, and not... <laughs> Not, not for the sole purpose of me just being rich. I want to share that wealth. I want to take care. I don't want no more homeless people on the street. Like, yeah. I really want yeah. to just remove or influence for us to come together and take care of every little small problem. Like, people ain't got no water to drink. People ain't got nowhere to live. You know? People ain't got and no you know problem. who that was reminiscent of? Tupac. Tupac felt that exact same way. Yeah. I just, I, I, I just wish he would just... Um, he was kind of like bipolar, like, you know, he was kind of, he was a sweetheart, and then he just, ah, real aggressive, too. Well, because he had a lot of rage in him. He saw a lot. You know, his mom was a panther. His dad was in jail. He saw a lot. We, so, all, saw, we all saw a lot. Yeah, yeah, but he did, <laughs> and he had such, he was very passionate um, about his Black people. He loved his people. He really did yeah, love but, Black yeah, people. I, I don't, I don't, I don't really know what all he was able to accomplish, but I know when he was in the position, he could have used that side more. Yeah. I, I feel. Yeah. Because he, but he was his, young. He never, but he was young too. You got to, you know, when you're young and dumb, you do you do stupid things, right? No, we can't we can't just blame that because he was intelligent. Yeah, he was very smart. <laughs> he, 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 he was just more emotional than he was using his intelligence. But do you think it was the people he was hanging around? But that's using your intelligence. But again, people are influenced by other people and you know that. Well let me well, that, that's a sign of weakness. Well it is. I'm not I'm not condoning it, but I'm just saying it it does happen to the best of us. Well me growing up in East Oakland, I've been I've been around a thousand should nights and I wasn't influenced to go okay. that route. It's yeah. just it's, it's it's in you. I mean, part of him wanted to be that, part of him wanted to be a revolution. He had all that in him, but he allowed himself to come to the other side, you know. And he liked that thug life, huh? <laughs> yeah, he, he loved it. He 
You know, yeah. I, I I knew the Digital Underground Tupac, and he was a good person. And I ain't okay. saying he was a bad person, but I know the softer side of him. And okay. The people's person, and I saw that. If you if you ask anybody about me, they're gonna say I was the same from nine years old to I am right now. But with him, it was a Digital Underground Tupac, and it was a Death Row Tupac. So it was two. It was two different two dynamics. Different. Okay, but Death Row was a really seemed like a really tough label to be on, right? Yeah, but it didn't change Dr. Dre. It didn't change Snoop Dogg. They, they. If you go back on them, they was the same from the beginning <laughs> to the end. <laughs> no okay. matter all, no matter all the adversities they went through. So it's all about choices, right? It's all about choices. All about being your individual, and that's. I just felt how intelligent and powerful Tupac was. Tupac was like a god in the in the in the, in the music industry. They won't let that man die right now. So he had the power then, especially alive, to do some of the things he wanted to get accomplished because he had a heart for that. So yeah, you know, yeah, he did have a yeah. heart for that. Yeah, that's too bad. Well, tragic ending, um, but you know. Such is life, we can't change that, can we? So before we end, would you like to leave some parting words with our audience and also let them know how they can reach you? Okay, let me get that part out of the way first. Elijah E. B. Baker on all social media outlets, uh, Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram, LinkedIn. I'm the hottest on Facebook though. You, you wanna catch me in the red form. I'm getting to know it, IG a little bit, but I like Facebook overall. So okay. if you want to catch Elijah in full form, full effect, go to Elijah E. B. Baker on Facebook and follow me. Okay. Okay. Very good. Very good. And so um, any parting words? I want everybody to be encouraged and come together, be unified. Um Name it and claim it. Follow your dreams. Don't let nobody uh, stop you. And only way you can miss your target is stop shooting for it. Nice. I like that. I like that. That's very positive. So, Elijah, I would like to thank you for being my guest. I wish you continued success with your family and career. To my audience, thank you for listening to Straight Talking with Kelly, where real conversations happen. Please hit that subscribe button, like, share, and make sure you return. So Elijah, thanks for coming. And I can't wait to do another interview with you. Yes, thank you for having me. All right, take care. All right, you too.